beautiful stuff. If this was given off the cuff, it was a beautiful improv spoken word song. But these prayers and these songs show us as we follow Jesus who he is and what we are like and how we can follow him and know him even better. So in the first week we saw Mary's prayer, which kind of historically, traditionally has been called the Magnificat. And last week, uh, Charlton really helpfully brought to us Simeon's song, which is historically called the, this is again, $6 word, just to show off at parties. Uh, one of my professors in college said, what's the point of knowing useless stuff if every once in a while you can't hold it over people's heads? Uh, if, if week one is called the Magnificat, last week's prayer that we looked at is called the Benedictus. Just, all, these, all these prayers are named after the first word in Latin. So Mary's prayer, first word in Latin is Magnificat. Last week, we saw Zechariah's prayer, and the, his first word in Latin is benedictus, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This week, we're looking at a very short prayer, a very short little <laughs> praise chorus song in Luke chapter 2. Um, and this one is kind of traditionally called the Gloria. We'll dig into that a little bit more. But let's read for context here. I'll start reading in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, and we'll read all the way through 14. I can't read this without thinking of Charlie Brown. I don't know what y'all's background is, but this is the Charlie Brown chapter. Um, but follow along with me in Luke chapter 2. In those days, so the same time all this was going on with, with Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary and Christ in the womb, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went out to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he's pleased. And Luke sets up this story. We, we saw this last week and the week before. Luke sets up his story at the very beginning of his gospel, saying, I was not here for this stuff. I did not personally witness this stuff. But I have undergone a whole lot of work. Theophilus, which is either a guy's real name or his nickname, because it means God friend. <laughs> Theophilus, I've done a lot of work to make sure that the stuff you learned in catechism, literally, the stuff you learned about the Lord Jesus is true. He, 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 he apparently has done a lot of eyewitness interviews, some really good investigative journalism to track down the people who were there, the people who did see these things in person. And, and under the power and the inspiration of the Spirit, what he wrote down is amazing. It's, it's interesting to know the facts, but even the way that Luke frames the facts should encourage us. And it honestly, sometimes make us giggle and laugh because there's, there's a good sense of humor in the Bible. I don't know if you all recognize that. The God, God takes all things seriously. And so we should take all things seriously except ourselves. I hope we never take ourselves too seriously. So we should be able to look at people in the world and, and, and giggle sometimes. I can't help but giggle a little bit if a grown man can giggle. I don't know. But I can't help but laugh a little bit or smirk at least. This whole story sets out with the ruler of the Roman world, the most powerful man in the Western world, trying to show off how great he is. And how does he do that? Well, uh, he's not me. He's an administrator. And so he says, I want to count how many people I own. <laughs> I want to count how many people owe me everything. I, I just want to know how many people I can boss around. 
And that number is going to show essentially how awesome I am. I'm big and bad. But the real glorious one, the real glorious God, not Caesar Augustus, who is still known as one of the most glorious Roman emperors of all time, the real glorious one, our glorious God and King, he shows off his power at the exact same time, but he doesn't do it by counting people. That's not hard for him. God shows off his power not by showing off his glory, but by humbling himself. God shows off how great he is by going the low road, not in terms of being dirty, but by by taking the route that no one else would take to love people that no one else would love. He humbles himself and he comes to the the poor and, and maybe we could say to the pointless people. And when the great God of all things wants to show off how good he is, he says, I'll, I'll show it, not by some big display of power, although what else is the incarnation but a huge display of power. He does it by coming to people who desperately need to be saved, but they don't even know it. Not, not in the way that God is going to save them. This is vintage God. This is, this is right along track with how God always acts in the world. He comes to people that are overlooked by the world and at best know they're in a bad spot. And at worst, don't even know it. But he comes to these people. He contrasts himself with Caesar. And not only does he do this by coming to a little girl named Mary and to a, a apparently nameless, unimportant guy named Joseph, who maybe was a carpenter. But who's, who's the first people to hear? Who gets, you know, my, my fridge right now has a birth announcement. My, my best friend from growing up just had his first child. You know, who gets the birth announcement for the Savior of the world? It's the shepherds, which I don't know about y'all. Um, this, this has gone back for thousands of years. We, we even know from the book of Genesis that shepherds were the lowest of the low jobs. I mean, this was the bluest of blue collar. My, my brother-in-law worked for a while on an oil rig in the coast. Uh, I mean, literally a dirty job. But also to see the way that he, get, he got treated as an oil rig worker, just as a, a roughneck guy. Um, nobody... Nobody would want their kids. We would say, I mean, we don't really mean this, but in our hearts, we would say, man, I hope my kid never grows up to have a job like that. Because no one's going to respect them. Um, They might get paid something, but, you know, I want something better for my kids. Well, the angels come to some guys who are the bluest of blue-collar guys to shepherds. Um, they They were disrespected. They were not treated well. I mean, essentially, they were, if you can call it this, paid homeless guys. Because they were paid to live out in the field. And make sure that, you know, they had to have some kind of skill to, 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 you know, ward off the big bad animals. But essentially, they were there just to make sure nothing happened. They were in some kind of ways, uh, if you took the 7-Eleven worker or the Circle K worker and sent them on a camping trip. Your job is to make sure that nothing here gets lost. <laughs> That's all you have to do. Now, of course, we realize there's a whole lot more to it than just that. But they were not respected. They were, they were not, um, well... If you heard the birth announcement through these guys, you would immediately doubt it. Because these were not guys, this, these were not the doctors and the lawyers and the Indian chiefs. These were not notary publics whose word was bond. These were nobodies. And they're the ones who get the birth announcement. Yeah, control. Is it days comparison to when someone has like bug Yeah. Right, yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, we. Uh, when these guys roll up in court, uh, these are the guys that, that like, you know, I, I, I have no legal background, but I watch a ton of Law and Order. Um, these are the guys who, these are the guys who roll up to court, and the, the lawyers are thinking, like, I don't know, like, was calling these guys to the stand, like, the best call? I don't know. Um, that's right. I mean, but these guys are the ones, again, that God chooses. These are the people that he shows off his glory to. Because like Paul is going to say later in the Bible, God shows off his greatness to the lowly. He, he shames the wisest people that we would respect. Not, um, well, he does it by going to these people. He, he, he does it because that's how he chooses to show up. And the, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the foolishness of God, quote unquote, is wiser than the wisest thing we ever could plan. And what, what happens to these guys? They're out in the field at night watching and out of nowhere, out of nowhere, something happens. 
something that if we were in their shoes, we'd do the exact same thing. I, that, you know, the, understandably, our, our, our Bible translations don't put it quite like this, but it is a fair translation to say, out of nowhere, something happens and these guys freak out. And, and how could they not? Because I, you know, what we see in verse 9 is, while they're out there in the middle of the night, an angel of the Lord appears to them. And we, we have to understand something about this story. Um, this is not like some secret hidden knowledge that the Bible has hidden from us. We just, over time, and really over the influence of kind of entertainment and pop culture, we have forgotten who we're dealing with when we talk about angels. And Charlton did a great job last week reminding us of this too. But these are God's shock troops. <laughs> these are not cute, fat little babies flying around. And they're not even... Um, you know, kind of wispy elf looking guys like what are sometimes in, in movies. They are really that. They are God's shock troops. They are his messengers. But we see that literally every time in the Bible, Old and New Testament, that an angel comes to a person and they know that it's an angel. What, what do they do? Yeah, they, 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 they're afraid and they fall down. Uh, even I, I can't help but think in, in the in the book of Revelation, John, who knows Jesus so well, he was at the Last Supper leaning up against Jesus' chest. Someone who knew exactly who Jesus was, who in the book of Revelation has seen crazy and real visions of Jesus in all of his glory and power. After he's seen those visions, we see in Revelation, an angel appears to him, and, G, and, and John says he falls on his face like a dead man. And the angel literally has to say, get up, don't worship me, I'm just an angel. So any of us, if an angel, if this happened to any of us, we would fall down either thinking that we had just met God or that we were about to die or both. It, it, it is a terrifying scene. They, they really do freak out when they see God's shock trooper. They are shocked. And so it makes sense that the first, if you're an angel, this must be so um, frustrating that the first thing you have to say to people all the time is, fear not. <laughs> Uh, you know, again, I, I read this in Charlie Brown voice, but it really is like, why do they always do this? Like, get up. Like, don't be afraid. Like, if, if I wanted you dead, you'd be dead. Okay? Like, get up. Fear not. Because look, that's what the word behold means. Look, I bring you good news. Literally, I, I'm evangelizing you. <laughs> this is what the Greek word is. Like, literally, guys, I have good news for you. And at, why does he tell the shepherds that they're going to find proof that this good news is real. He, he gives them a sign. And what's the sign? That they're going to find a baby that we would think uh, is going to show up on the 10 o'clock news because it looks like it's been abandoned. It's lying in a food trough wrapped up in spare rags. And when you see that baby, the angel says, you'll know God is saving the world. What do these guys do? Well, they don't have time to do anything because as soon as the angel says this weird and amazing thing, his best friends show up. We see, what is this in verse 13? There was suddenly with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. And again, this is one where maybe Charlie Brown has infected us with bad thinking. <laughs> maybe we think this is a, a, a really cute, or maybe like, an, like a, a very holy and awe-inspiring and, and beautiful moment. No, if one angel freaks you out, what do you think when the rest of the, of not even just the platoon, but the company shows up? That's what, that's what this word means, literally in Greek, is a company of heaven's army. <laughs> That's what, you know, host just means a group of soldiers. And this is heaven's soldiers, and it's a whole company of them. They show up in the sky, on the ground. They are there, and they start praising God and saying. You know, this is interesting. Again, I, I feel like I'm just, like, stomping all over everything we love about Christmas cards today. But it, 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 this is helpful, I think, to know. Did you know that in the Bible, angels are never once, not never once, recorded as singing? Uh, they, 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 we see angels all the time. If you, if you do a word search, you just look up the word angel, you'll see like 2,000 hits. Um, but they're constantly praising God. And sometimes they're described as shouting to God. But they're never once said to sing. So sadly, I mean, I, love, I, I, I took an art history class in college. Those paintings are cool. Um, they just get everything wrong. Um, especially so that this picture, this is, you know, don't think like the choir lined up with like the tenors over here and the altos over. Don't think that. I mean, this really is like the platoon in formation shouting. 
You know, if one angel is enough to freak you out, I don't know how many the multitude, I don't know how many the company of angels is, but how freaky is this? How terrifying? I, I lived in, in Columbia, South Carolina, where Fort Jackson is, and um, I, I really had the pleasure of the the head drill sergeant for all of Fort Jackson. So he, his job was just to supervise drill, sar- drill instructors. He was in my small group. <laughs> and so and, and he, he would share with me, you know, what's it like for a graduating class of just just people who've made it through boot camp. We're not talking the shock troops. We're not talking like the officer class. We're talking just the, 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 the gruntiest of the grunts. When those guys make it through basic training and the ceremony of seeing, you know, a few hundred of them march in formation and show up on the field and you hear the, 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 the solemnity and the seriousness of these guys taking their vows and, and answering everything in unison, hearing them shout out, it's kind of freaky. Like, you understand, these guys are not here to play hug and kiss. These guys could kill people. That's what they're trained to do if they have to. When human beings in formation shout out something, uh, you pay attention. When the, the, the soldiers of heaven show up <laughs> in some way and they start shouting praises to God, I don't know how the shepherds hold it together. But what is it that angels say when they praise God? You know, these, 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 and these uh, heavenly shock troops, what do they say? They say really briefly, but man, I think it's enough <laughs> in verse 14. They say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he's pleased. These are, these are mirroring clauses. There's that first clause, glory to God in the highest, and the next one mirrors it. So not, not in the highest, or not among those in the high places. We'll talk about that. Those guys give God glory. And the rest of you on earth, people that God is pleased with on earth, peace. That's, that's the praise song here in this mirroring clause. And what's interesting as we think about this, what does it mean that the angels say glory to God in the highest? Now, you know, we think in the highest, maybe that's like the greatest praise. You know, may God be praised above all other things. You know, the highest praise belongs to God. And that's true. Like, that's what he deserves. But that's really not what the angels are saying here. They're either saying, and these two things are really not very different. They're either saying in the highest spiritual realms that God has not revealed too much to us about. In those high heavenly vaults. May God be praised. Or, the word in can also be translated among. May God receive glory among the highest spiritual beings. You know, this is what we, we saw in Daniel. There is, a, there is a mysterious world that God has not revealed too much to you and me about. We saw that when, when Gabriel says, Yeah, I was going to come and help you out, Daniel, but I got tied up with the prince of Persia. And there's this talk about this guy, Angel Michael, fighting all these battles. It's just referenced. I mean, God doesn't give us the details about it. That's, a, that's what's going on here, and I know that not just because it is kind of an interesting thought, but, but listen to how the Apostle Paul, in the letter to the Ephesians, talks about what Christ has done. You know, we, we, we rightly, when we hear and understand the gospel, and even when we're trained to share the gospel with other people, when someone says, well, what's, what do you believe? Why, what's, why did Jesus come into the world? We're right, To say that Jesus came into the world to save sinners and to forgive the awful things that we've done. But that by no means is the only way to explain the gospel. We know that because that's not the only way the Bible talks about the gospel. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 1. He praises Jesus. And he says that Jesus deserves honor and glory and respect because as he has returned to his father's right hand, as he finished his earthly ministry, he's returned to the seat of honor he always had. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says that Jesus has gone to the father's right hand. And what's that mean? He is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Well, who, who has rule and authority and power and dominion? Like, it's just God, right? So he hasn't ascended above that. That's kind of tricky to think about. What's Paul saying? No, he's, he's really not talking about God's authority and God's rule and authority and power and dominion. And he's not speaking only of human rule and authority and power and dominion. I know because look in chapter 3, as Paul again puts a different spin on the exact same thing. He's saying that in, Christ, in the way that Christ has come and lived and died and resurrected and he's ascended to heaven again, all of this has happened, Paul says, 
because God was working out a plan. And that plan in Ephesians chapter 3 is to include not just Jewish folks, but to include people from every tribe and tongue and nation and language, to include all of them in this grand plan God has to fix everything that sin has broken. And that grand plan in, 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 a, in a, oh gosh, like I can't wait, I can't wait to be in the new heavens and earth with Paul or to ask the source himself. What did you really, can you give me a little more on that? Because I'm really curious. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11, Paul says that this whole plan of God to redeem and fix everything we broke in and through Jesus Christ, this was to show, this was in accordance with the eternal plan that he's realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. The, the sentence before that in verse 10, he says, this is showing off through the church his glory to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The, the gospel does all kinds of things, but one of a million things the gospel does is to show off to other created supernatural beings that God really knows how to run his world, that he's wise, that he's good, that he's compassionate, that he's kind. Peter references this as well in 1 Peter chapter 1, that, that in God working out his plan to save sinners, normal people like you and me who don't know what we don't know about what's going on behind the scenes of history. In doing all this, Peter says angels look into this and they, they, they look at it like they're examining something through a microscope, like, I don't get this. This is a mystery to me. This is amazing. It, it really is to... Uh, I, I couldn't help but think there's this, there's this line in Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, there are more things in the heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. As Christians, we ought to be super okay with saying, there's a whole lot of stuff I don't know. <laughs> there's, what, what I do know, I'm very confident in because God told me, and he never lies, he keeps all of his promises. So what God tells me, I'm confident in. But there are hints and glimmers of things in the scriptures that are just kind of referenced. And, and, and we, we want to jump in, understandably, we want to jump in. It's, my, my kids do this. I don't know if y'all do as well. Where Chelsea and I are having an adult conversation and a kid wants to jump in and I don't feel like backtracking and starting from the beginning and telling the kid the whole conversation. So I just say, um, hey, I'm talking to mama. I'll tell you what you need to know, but just chill out. Uh, that's what we do when we come to stories like this. And so when the angels sing glory to God in the highest places or, or glory to God among the highest ones, we are seeing something that we don't understand, but it's enough to make us say, wow. I, I want to bring this up here at this point, uh, especially if you have been discipled by Charlie Brown. Um, there's, there's, it bears talking about a, a minor translation issue here, or if you know, either growing up with Charlie Brown or if you grew up reading the King James Version. You know, I, the, the version I just read might be a little confusing because that's not what the Bible says, right? It's, I just read glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he's pleased. Well, I thought it was peace on earth, goodwill to men. It's not the same thing, Christian. This is, this is getting at a place, I think it's helpful and really healthy for us to talk about how we get the Bible that we have. This, this all goes to help us pray and understand what we're saying to God when we talk to him. The King James Version is a miracle and a, an amazing feat of human scholarship because these men, at a time when understanding the Greek and Hebrew languages had been lost for hundreds, if not thousands of years, they did an incredible job translating the, ancient, the most ancient copies of the Bible that they had. It, it truly is. It's, it's amazing. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a King James guy, but you have got to give cred where cred is due. What's happened, though, in the 400 years since the King James Version um, was translated is that by God's kindness, we have found even more ancient copies of the Bible, even more ancient manuscripts. And this is what's crazy. Uh, I, love, I love stories like this because they don't make us doubt the Word of God. They, sh they should make us have great confidence that God has given us exactly the Bible he wants us to have. More ancient manuscripts have found that in this particular verse, there is a one-letter difference in one word. And that one-letter difference in one word changes the meaning of the verse a lot. The, the, the copies of the Bible that the King James translators had, that it, it, it is rightly translated, peace on earth, goodwill to men. 
But these older copies of the Bible, that one letter difference changes it not from peace on earth, goodwill to men, but peace on earth to men with whom God is pleased. To not just men, but men and women, to people that have, they have been goodwilled by God. They have been favored by God. That they have received grace. They, uh, Spike. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And, and, and whenever we talk about, you know, people with whom God is pleased or the good and the wicked, we can, we can real quickly slide into some unbiblical thinking and thinking, well, you're just saying this is just good news for good people or this is good news for people who've deserved it. Um, you know, there's no peace among the wicked. Well, here's, the, here's what the New Testament shows us that even more clearly than the Old Testament does. And Spike, I'm so glad you referenced that. We are the wicked. <laughs> We, we are bad people. We are not people who were looking for God. Who, who's, who is the angel? Who are the angels saying this to? Like I said, uh, professional homeless guys. <laughs> uh, guys who are, I mean, rancher is putting too highly a term on it. These people have been favored by God. They are those with whom he is pleased, not because they did anything to please him, but because like Martin Luther taught, he's, he's, this is just summarizing the Bible, he, he's so right. The love of God doesn't go out like a magnet looking for something good and choosing to stick to that and love it. Now, the love of God is creative because the love of God goes out and looks for ugly things and says, I want to make that beautiful. The love, we, God doesn't love like we do. He, he, he intentionally goes out looking for ugly things like the bluest blue collar guy who was not looking for God who was not some scholar sitting, reading his, all of his theology books, waiting for the time of God's salvation to come. No, these were just regular guys doing their job. And they are the ones who meet God's shock troops and hear this amazing thing. So I, I bring up this whole translation thing only to point out, you know, really those two things aren't saying crazy different things. But what we, I think rightly have in our, in our versions of the Bible based on the most ancient copies of the Bible. What we have, I hope, is really encouraging to us as we look at this prayer, because these men are not just hearing a message. They're not overhearing a prayer and a song that says, in some fuzzy, ambiguous way, like we might read this, um, peace on earth. Hey guys, people who are fighting all the time, chill out, man. That's not the message they're saying. They're saying, glory to God among these great angelic beings in these heavenly places and peace to people who don't deserve it. Peace to people who have received favor for no human reason. Peace to people in the real world because God has come out to find you. That's the song. I, I appreciate the fact that God has given us these older copies of the Bible because this angelic message, the birth announcement that goes on the fridge includes glory to God and grace. It, you know, what, what's happened with this song? Of course, this is, this is the Charlie Brown chapter, so we know that the peanuts have immortalized this, but throughout history, again, the point of walking through these four songs in Luke is to show that this has been seen as not just a really big deal, not just a great story to remember during the Christmas season, but if this is how angels talk to God, well, we should probably copy them somehow. <laughs> And that's exactly what's happened in the history of the church. We know that going back to at least the 300s, this song starts being called, even though the one verse it is, the song starts being called the Gloria, because that's the first word of the song in Latin. Like we've kind of established that pattern. In, in, in the Latin, the first phrase goes, Gloria in excelsis Deo, which we turn into some... That's an unsingable Christmas carol. How many of y'all can hold out your breath long enough to sing, Gloria? Y'all are better than I am. Um, I love the song. I was just not man enough to sing it. Um, but this, this song has been used across cultures, Eastern, Western Christianity, from the very earliest church, as far back as we know, up to today. Did you know that this, this prayer is still prayed every Sunday by most Christians around the world? If, if you're going merely by numbers and statistics. What I, in, so for, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, for example, this prayer, the Gloria, is prayed every single Sunday as a part of the worship service. 
in, in the Roman Catholic Church, um, not during Advent and not during Lent, but every other Sunday, the Gloria is prayed and recited during the Mass in the Anglican Church. So, a little more on our team, <laughs> Team Protestant. The Ang- our, our Episcopal and our Anglican brothers and sisters pray this every week as well, except during Advent and during Lent. I mean, I guess I get the reasoning, but whatever. The point is, they pray this prayer all the time, not just Christmas time, because it's not just a Christmas time message. This is not just a way to respond to God as, as we think about the baby coming. This is, this, this, I actually have this prayer written out on a post-it note in my Bible. This is the prayer that's prayed during uh, the Anglican communion service, which, of course, is every service in the Anglican church. Every time that the priest offers the bread and the wine to God's people to remind them of the gospel, they pray this prayer, therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You see how how the, the Gloria get stuck together with a bunch of other prayers to say, what else can we say when we remember that Jesus gave his body for us? That he came in order to have a body, in order to give it up for us. What else could we say but glory to God? And, and, and to receive peace ourselves as we remember this. The point is, our Christian family has used this prayer verbatim, or at least as a foundation, for something we should say to God all the time. Regularly, and, and, and if we wouldn't remember to do it on our own, we need to be reminded of it all the time. So how should we pray and how should we sing? What's the point for us? We're not, we're not Anglican. We're certainly not Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. Uh, so we're, uh, that's not our team. But even as Southern Baptists, what does it mean to look at the Gloria, to hear this prayer and to think, what does it look like for us to pray like this and to sing like this? Yeah, the, the encouraging thing is I bet we already do. <laughs> the, the fun part about this is I bet I'm preaching to the choir. So either be encouraged by what you're already doing or consider how this kind of prayer could influence you more and to know God better. I, I really have two things I want us to see really obviously in this very short prayer. And the first thing is this, praise is a response to who God is and what God has done. Especially who Christ is and what God has done for the world, for the universe in Christ. I I say that elementary, kindergarten-level thing because I think we all forget that praise doesn't start with us ramping ourselves up. (laughs) I I have to get myself pumped in order to praise God. I need, to, I need to have a happy face, or I need to have had a really good day, or I had a tremendous time of prayer and reading the Bible, then I can praise God. Well, you can, sure. But be real careful about saying, I can't praise God until I'm right. That's a dangerous thing, because you're going to hit seasons of life where you're just not right for a long time. But real praise, biblical praise, starts with remembering who God is, because he's always right. And, and, who, and what God has done, he's always done the right things. The, the angels praise God because he sent Christ. That's the most important thing that's ever happened. And it shows not just what God do, does, but it shows his heart. His heart toward his creation. And it shows it more clearly than anything else God has ever done. And so if if you and I want to react in worship, if we want to rejoice and feel happy thoughts, (laughs) don't, don't start by looking for happy thoughts in yourself. Start by thinking about God. Because if we can't rev up our hearts to praise God, if we feel like giant fakes whenever we're singing and praying in church because we're saying that we praise God, but honestly, I don't know that I really do. Well, that's okay. Because it just means you're a sinner. And that's okay in the sense that God only redeems sinners. He comes for sick people. He comes for people whose hearts are not in the right place. He comes for people who do not on their own naturally know how to talk to him. He comes to forgive and to change you in that situation and in that season. So if we can't bring ourselves to praise God for what he's done, even for us, if we, if we remember the gospel, and, and to be quite honest and frank, if we're kind of bored, 
by hearing this thing that we've heard a lot, maybe for a long time. Praise him for what he's doing, like the angels do here. Praise God for what he's doing in the rest of the universe. Again, zoom out on your life, like we saw Mary do in the Magnificat. Zoom out outside of yourself for a second and think about what, is, what does Christ coming mean for literally everything? Listen to Paul in 2 in Corinthians chapter 5. Again, this is a famous evangelism verse, but see the context. He's talking to this church who essentially are, they are rejecting him, the, the, the man who planted their church. And they've kind of made fun of his theology and his leadership, and they've adopted new leaders. And Paul is really kind of in conflict. And look at what Paul says to these people. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Look, the, the new has come. All this, all this new creation, everything that God is doing in Christ, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Paul praises God because we get something these angelic shock troops never got. We got grace. You understand this in the story of the Bible, that these, again, we only hear hints and glimmers of this throughout the pages of Scripture. The angels who rebelled against God, God never got grace. There was no forgiveness or mercy for them. They, they've been shut up, Second Peter tells us, until the day of judgment. Like they're they have no day in court. We have a day in court that we got out of because of who Christ is for us. And not only do we get out of it, do we receive mercy and grace, God then gives to us uh, something to do. And, and not just busy work or, or, or piddly work. God gives us the most important work in the world. He works through us to bring the world to himself. We get to be people who, whether we stay at home all day, or whether we are out and about meeting a million people every day, we get to be people who have a message to share with the world. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> that is something worth praising God about. Or again, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul, I love Paul because he gets about two and a half chapters into Ephesians before he ever actually talks to the Ephesians. He mostly just praises God for a chapter and a half. <laughs> In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, In Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So you and I have off days. And, and maybe even we feel guilty now because it's like, oh gosh, like 2 Corinthians, like I'm this messenger, I've got this high calling and I'm doing a pretty cruddy job at it. Like that's not encouraging Christian, that's discouraging because I'm not really a good minister, I'm not really a good ambassador of reconciliation. Then remember Ephesians 1, that God is fixing everything. God is fixing everything when you're having a bad day. God is fixing everything when you are crazy disobedient and you have no love in your heart for him and no love for people. When you are bored with the gospel, when you have no interest in evangelism or discipleship, those are not okay places to be. But we can praise God to say, God, I, I'm not doing my part, whatever my part even is, but you cannot be stopped. You cannot be thwarted. And, and what you're doing is good. And so God, even, even as an act of confession, I say, you're amazing. You are better than I could ever imagine. Glory to you. Now, you know, in, in the highest, among the highest spirit, spiritual beings and the highest places in the universe, but even, even me, God, even I, a sinner, give you glory because you're amazing. You know, think about the reaction in the supernatural realm to Christ ascending again. We see in Colossians chapter 1, it's, it's a great big party. Heaven throws open the gates to welcome home the prince. Who's, he's bringing the conquering army behind him. Not 
demons and, and all the bad guys, but we are the conquered. We are the people who follow him into heaven as his, as his prisoners of war, the best prisoner of war situation we could ever imagine. Think about the reception for that king. Think about how he will make everything right again. Think about how in that moment, literally there was glory to God among the highest and in the highest places. In, in our own ways, we're not trying to impress God with our cool vocabulary. In your own way, say, wow. <laughs> say, wow. And that's a sp- response to who God is and what he's done. And secondly and lastly, as we sing and as we pray to God in the car, uh, while we're cooking dinner, while we're doing chores, in between meetings at work, recognize that the benefits that Christ gives us are great, but not as great as Christ himself. What do I mean by that? It is very possible for me, and I, I, so I'm assuming for you, because I'm really nothing special, it's very possible for me to pray and to sing about what Jesus gives me and totally forget that he gives me himself too. So it's, it's very easy for me, for example, to, to thank God for grace or to pray for forgiveness or to ask for him to show his power. It's easy for me to do that and realize I'm not even, I'm not talking about Jesus at all. I'm not, I'm not really talking to God as if he's God. I'm, he's this great dispenser of gifts in the world and I, I just want to hit the button and out pops out my Coke. Like, I don't have any respect for the dispensing machine. <laughs> That, that, is that, I don't know if that's true of you guys or not in your prayers. I, I need reminders that we get peace on earth, not because we asked for some generic sense of peace, but because peace came through a real person, according to a real person's plan. And, and, and in, in his plan, in accordance with it, he did things for me and for you. And he, in that, and even now at the right hand of the Father, is still himself advocating for me and for you. He gives us peace. Like maybe I'm splitting hairs here, but I, I don't know that I am. We don't want to be overly critical about it, but how long can you and I pray before we start drifting away from Christ and only thinking about what Christ gives us? Um, this is a silly question. It's, it, this really is splitting hairs, but I think it's got a point to it. Um, someone asked me years ago, if Christ never did anything for you, Christian, if he never did anything besides make you, would, would, you, would he still deserve you to be impressed? By, to be impressed? <laughs> would, would, would Christ still deserve to be worshipped if he never did anything for you besides make you? Now, of course, that, thank God, that's a f- false question, right? But it, it helps me diagnose my heart because so, so many times, um, I get angry at God or frustrated or disappointed because God doesn't give me what I want him to give me. Um, or, again, I seek after the gifts, but I kind of don't care about the giver. I, I, I think I'm just a part of a cultural problem. In my own heart, I recognize our culture has a poverty of all. We're just sinfully hard to please. Um, it's hard to impress me. I, I, I wish I, I wish, I weren't, I wish I weren't true, but it, it is. And so in, in, as I read this prayer myself and, and think about what the angels are saying to God, consider with me just for a second Christ, who is fully God and fully man. I sat at Jalapenos this week talking to a brand new Christian about this, about God being fully God and fully man, and it moved me to tears over chips and salsa. Not because um, I have some great theological mind, but because I hardly think about that like I should. That the, if he never did anything, who Christ is, is literally unique. There is no being in the universe who is both God and man. And who would become man so that he could humble himself and suffer for me and for you. That he would do the most embarrassing thing, take the greatest demotion, <laughs> because he loves me. And he wants me to and he wants you to be with him. He created everything. And like we see in Hebrews, he, he continues to sustain everything. He upholds everything by the word of his power. Everything that was made, John says, was made through Jesus. 
and he became an honest to goodness person, just like you and me. How humble is that? How self-sacrificing is that? How loving is that? And, and so for you and I to read this prayer, and as, as we pray throughout the day, how many opportunities do we have not to skip over who Christ is? To only think about his gifts and not ask for him. I, I, I see this in myself, I see it in my children, and I realize I act like a child in my prayers because I'm so ungrateful. So many of my prayers, unless God helps me in Scripture to correct my course, so many of my, my prayers are gimme, gimme, gimme. And again, he, he's a good, he, God, God is a kind father. He wants us to ask for things. Don't hear me saying that. But I am, if I have to wait for the gift, my attitude and my heart show me I'm really not super pleased with the giver. I, it shows in my heart that the giver and having him himself is really not good enough for me. And that's ugly. Um, how evil are, is my heart? How bratty is my heart? to skip over the most beautiful person in the world just so I can grab at stuff, even if it's good stuff, even if it's good stuff for other people. I, I couldn't help this, this time of year, uh, I have a certain playlist that's basically on repeat, uh, and it's a weird mix of songs, so I don't know what kind of insight it gives into my musical taste, but um, one, of my, one that I go back to, I think I've got multiple versions of this song, is actually a, a pretty modern Christmas song. It was written in the 1930s by a missionary bishop in China. Um, it, was, it was a British guy named Frank Houghton, um, and he was part of a ministry that was started by the missionary Hudson Taylor. We might be a little familiar with him, and, and his missions agency, OMF, um, started off China Inland Mission, but then changed. Frank Houghton was in a northern part of China, far away from modern amenities, far away from technology and civilization, and as the Communist Party was really gaining hold before World War II, as, Chris, as, as Chinese Christians were being put to death, and as foreign missionaries were slowly but surely being kicked out of the country more and more quickly, it came to be Christmas one year, and Bishop Frank Houghton recognized he was really not that excited about Christmas. Because <laughs> it was a hard year for Chinese Christians, whom he'd, he'd given his life to. And so he disciplined himself to look at verses like this, and, 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 and passages like the Benedictus that we saw last week, and, and prayers like the Song of Mary, the Magnificat, that we saw two weeks ago. He, he read through the prayers of the New Testament, specifically around Christ's birth, and he, again, this is so common. This is how so many of our great songs were written. Someone wrote a poem as a part of their devotion to discipline themselves to think carefully about what they were going to say to God. And somehow it gets shared with people and then it kind of becomes this great hymn of the faith. This is one I wish we knew more often. Frank Houghton wrote this song and the first line of the song is kind of becomes its title, Thou Who Wast Rich Beyond All Splendor. And written on the mission field and, and he, he, he prays to God, Thou who wast rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake became poor. Thrones for a manger didst surrender. Sapphire paved courts for stable floor. Thou who wast rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake became poor. Thou who art God beyond all praising, all for love's sake became man. Stooping so low, but sinners raising heavenwards by thine eternal plan. Thou who art God beyond all praising, all for love's sake, became man. Thou who art love beyond all telling, Savior and King, we worship thee. Emmanuel, within us dwelling, Make us what thou wouldst have us be. Thou who art love beyond all telling. Savior and King, we worship thee. This is the Savior we have. Whether we're living on the mission field in China or we're living on the mission field in Effingham, this is our Savior and our King. And like C.S. Lewis rightly said, if we have him, we got everything. So even, even in, in the fun of Christmas and, and the joy of those things and the, the, the normalcy and the boringness of our regular lives, Christmas time or not, when we pray to the Lord, don't, 
Don't miss him. Don't miss that he is the one we're singing glory to, that he is the one who gives us peace. Ask for peace, but, but let me challenge myself as well as for you. Let's ask him for more of himself, to know him better. And if he gives peace, which he, he promises to, then that's great. But if we have to wait for peace, we've got him. Which, to quote the great theologian Bill Murray in Caddyshack, is a pretty good thing to have going for you. <laughs> Our time is up. So, so let's ask just that, that Jesus would help us, that in him we would praise this God. And, and with the power of his spirit, we would become more and more like him. That would be the best thing that could happen to us, this Christmas or any. So, so let's pray together. Father, Son, and Spirit, you are that good. Um, we, we hear what the angels say, we hear their message, and we, we thank you that it's true. And, and um, Lord, we confess that honestly we're not afraid of the angels. We, we really, we hardly fear you like we should. Um, and and we, we, we confess that's wrong, and, and we ask that you would help us to change, that you would forgive us, and that we wouldn't be like this forever. But instead, you would make us more like Jesus, this glorious one whom all the angels praise this amazing person who has always been but has come into the world for us and for our salvation so that bad people could receive grace and peace. We, we worship you, Jesus. We join with all the angels and the archangels. We join with everyone who's gone before us and whose spirits are now in your presence. And we say that you are holy and that you are good. And glory be to your name. And as we, as we join with even more of our brothers and sisters now to sing and to pray and to worship you, Please make yourself known to us through the pages of your word and in our prayers and our songs and the fellowship and the love of your people in your supper. Make us meet with you, Jesus. Come Holy Spirit and help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.